ഇസ്രായേൽ ഭാഗ്യായി മാസിയക്കിട്ട് വേണ്ട അറിയതി സുഹൃത്തായി Tonight, positive momentum. The Ceylon Chamber of Commerce commenced the country's vaccination drive and called for removal of export blocks. I think we have a good opportunity even with the UK to do a free trade because they have come out of the European Union. I think with the vaccinations now, tourism can finally start to recover. The vaccinations are progressing well in other countries as well. No need to worry. The arrival of 4 million more Sinopharm vaccines is announced. Medical experts dispel public fears over vaccine effectiveness. Whatever the available evidence, but all the vaccines currently which we are using are effective against Delta variant. Always a favorite. Singapore's foreign minister expresses confidence in Sri Lanka investment attractiveness. Sri Lanka remains an attractive destination for Singapore enterprises, large, medium and small. No other option. The UNP leader continues to urge the government to seek out the IMF or face economic disaster. All that and much more coming up on First at Nine. This Wednesday, the 28th of July, 2021. Signal Chakon Limon Dan Thale Pia Sudhu Van Daddi Pilak Labade Siri Laka Sina Surakewa From Adha Dherana, this is Adha Dherana First at Nine. Live from Studio 24 in Colombo. Good evening. Welcome to First at Nine. I'm Dhammik Eknai. President Gautabi Rajpaksha was urged to immediately look at signing a free trade agreement with the United Kingdom during a meeting with the newly elected office bearers of the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce yesterday. Making the request, Chamber of Commerce Chairman Vish Govindasamy informed the President that this remains an ideal opportunity as the UK government is currently signing preferential trade agreements since its exit from the European Union. The CCC representatives also commended the government's vaccination drive, which they say has allowed corporates to resume work sooner than expected. The Ceylon Chamber of Commerce has assured President Gotabe Rajapaksa that it is eager to promote a number of sectors, including exports and tourism, as soon as the country returns to normalcy with its vaccination drive. While commending the government on its rapid vaccination drive, newly elected Ceylon Chamber of Commerce Chairman Vish Govindasamy called on the President to look into entering into a free trade agreement with the United Kingdom and take advantage of its exit from the European Union. First of all, I also must congratulate you in making sure the vaccinations are now in full force. <laughs> and I think that's a great blessing for the private sector. Uh, at Thank least you. people can get back to work uh, and that, that's really helping us. I think we have a good opportunity even with the UK Excellency to do a free trade because now they're doing lots of free trades because they have come out of the European Union. Yeah. So maybe it's a good thing to, for us to work uh, with a free trade agreement even with the UK, UK because we are a large exporter to the United Kingdom yeah. and we can increase our exports if we can take out some of the uh, obstacles in between and promote our exports because I think that's the only going forward yeah. we need export and tourism together to yeah. keep bringing in the foreign exchange yeah. uh, into the country. So our thrust from the chamber will be continuously working towards getting more exports and pushing uh, uh, the uh, tourism uh, because I think a lot of infrastructure has been put in in the last few years for tourism. So now I think it's best time to use those uh, yeah. infrastructure. And uh, now under Excellency, even the road system is developing very fast. So that also will only increase us within the country, moving around quickly and getting things done. I think uh, just to add to what Vish said, to congratulate you and the government on the vaccinations, I think that was a big priority and it's progressing very well. Uh, we wanted to touch a little, I think there has been a lot of discussion about exports, but also to touch a little on tourism I think with the vaccinations now, tourism can finally start to start to recover and the vaccinations are progressing well in other countries as well. And I think given some of the issues we are having around foreign exchange earnings, tourism can be a way to quickly recover 
on that hardest say was to very janata vishwas here now sang yogi ki rainu roofing sa ceiling sheet health experts have again reassured the public that evidence has adequately proven that all vaccines used in sri lanka are effective against the highly contagious delta variant of covid-19 however the message is that people should continue to adhere to health and safety precautions as there is no difference in the pre preventive measures for any variant Meanwhile, in more good news for the country's vaccination rollout, the Sri Lankan embassy in China confirmed today that the country is set to receive 4 million doses of the Sinopharm vaccine between the 4th and the 8th of August. With cases of hospitalization on the rise in the country throughout the many COVID-19 waves the country has battled so far, the issue of easing the pressure on the health sector has been at the forefront of the efforts. With that, health authorities commenced a pilot project recently in the Western province where asymptomatic patients were to be treated in their homes through a systematic process of close monitoring. With the project still underway, Deputy Director of Education and Research at the Ministry of Health, Dr. Hemant Herat, commented on its current status. This system is kept alive throughout the past, even though there is a decline of patients because we should not disband this system because if the need arises, again, establishing it is a little difficult process. So therefore, even at this moment, this pilot project is going on and there are patients kept at home and looked after through this system. So therefore, I would like to inform the public that don't get unnecessarily worried about keeping these patients. There is a system through which their general condition is monitored. And if somebody gets any complications or illness becomes worse, they will be immediately transferred to the nearest hospital and then required care will be given. Further, Dr. Herath also responded to media reports which he says had erroneously quoted him with regards to a lack of sufficient oxygen supplies to treat COVID-19 patients. I would inform that I have not made such a statement and also I would like to state that the Health Ministry is capable of catering the demand of oxygen, not only the current demand existing at this moment, but any excessive demand unexpected and the Ministry of Health has made all plans to make sure that buffer capacity is available to treat or provide oxygen to needy patients. Meanwhile, yesterday, 1,711 COVID-19 infections were reported in the island. The Kalamu district confirmed the highest infections with 481, while Gampa reported the second highest of 310. In addition, 228 infections were reported from Kalutara and 109 from Batiklo. The remaining 560 infections came from 21 other districts. Further, 23 foreign arrivals too tested positive for COVID-19 during yesterday. Meanwhile, in more good news for the country's vaccination drive, the Sri Lankan embassy in China announced that a further 4 million doses of Sinopharm vaccines will arrive in Sri Lanka between the 4th and 8th of August. So far, Sri Lanka has obtained 10.8 million doses from China. In more news, Minister of Health Pavitra Vanya Rachi confirmed that 728,460 doses of AstraZeneca vaccines will land in Sri Lanka next Saturday. According to the minister, priority is to be given to 490,000 people who obtain their first doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine. In the meantime, 380,463 people were inoculated yesterday. According to the Epidemiology Unit, 338,914 people were administered the first dose of the Sinopharm vaccine, while 28,054 received the second dose. In addition, 30 people were inoculated with the first dose of Pfizer yesterday. A further 13,465 people were given their first dose of the Moderna vaccine as well. With that, a total of 8,232,194 people have received at least one dose of the COVID-19 vaccine so far, while 1,886,930 people have been given two vaccine shots as of last evening. In the meantime, health experts have once again urged seniors above the age of 60 to get vaccinated and help reduce the number of COVID-19 mortalities. Still, nearly 80% of the deaths are occurred about 60 years of age. Other than that, 80% of the deaths reported among people with other comorbidities. These are the people need to get vaccination. Please promote them to get their vaccination because we are having vaccines. Now, currently, there is no much rush even in the vaccination centres. Take this opportunity. Further, Dr. Guinea also addressed public concerns of current vaccines being ineffective in preventing infection and hospitalization. Whatever the available evidence, but all the vaccines currently which we are using are effective against Delta variant. Because of that, I think that's some consolation. But still, main issue is that today's in the globalization concept, one country can't protect that particular territory, its particular plan. Because even a strong mutated viral strain started, it will spread rapidly to all over the country. Because even that Delta is not in India, but all 
example, even in the US, nearly 20% of the case load is due to Delta. Because of that, globally, cases will harm. We have to take maximum measures we have already taken to protect importation of the thing. Because of the random sampling technique which we use, we have found Delta viruses in certain clusters. But main key message is whether it's a Delta or Alpha, preventive measures are same. Because sometimes I think our people also now getting Delta strain as a, some excuse. But it's not excuse. We have to practice our day-to-day -day protective measures. Because luckily, vaccination program is all out. That's going to be additional support for us. But that's along not enough. We have to further strengthen our basic preventive measures. Leader of the United National Party, Ranil Vikramasinghe, today warned that the government is heading towards an imminent economic disaster unless it goes to the International Monetary Fund for an emergency bailout. The former Prime Minister added that if it does so, its debt options will increase with an IMF guarantee and loans can be sought from foreign nations to tide over its foreign reserves position. अपिट Singapore's Foreign Minister Dr. Vivian Balakrishnan says that Sri Lanka has always been and will continue to be an attractive investment destination for Singaporean businesses of all scales. His comments came as he addressed the launch ceremony of a special joint postal stamp commemorating 50 years of diplomatic ties between Sri Lanka and his country. A joint stamp release ceremony was held at the Foreign Ministry in Colombo yesterday to mark the 50th anniversary of the establishment of diplomatic ties between Sri Lanka and Singapore on the same day back in 1970. The milestone event was held with the participation of Foreign Minister Dinesh Kunumaradana and Singapore's Minister for Foreign Affairs Dr. Vivian Balakrishnan who joined in virtually. Sri Lanka is situated in the world's third largest water which commands 60% of the world's GDP, sees 80% of the world's shipborne energy, transport through the waters that we share and facilitates 46% of the world's merchandise trade. 55% of the world's container traffic ply through these waters. Sri Lanka and Singapore shares not only the commonality of being equatorial island nations in Asia, but much greater future in maritime related economy, trade, investments, data connectivity and tourism. Singapore's astonishing transformation into an economic powerhouse inspired by Singapore's success as a key financial center. President Gotabe Rajapaksa's government too has embarked on a new chapter of socio-economic development with the Colombo International Financial City Centre based at the Colombo Port City. Addressing the event, Singapore's Foreign Minister Dr. Vivian Balakrishnan stated that Sri Lanka still remains an attractive investment destination for Singaporean businesses, both large and small. We celebrate today the 50th anniversary of the diplomatic relations, but in fact, the maritime, the trade, the cultural links between Sri Lanka and Singapore in fact go back several centuries. Over the years, <clears throat> the small but very vibrant Sri Lankan community in Singapore has made significant contributions to our development. Our very own first foreign minister, Mr. S. Rajaratnam, was himself of Sri Lankan heritage. The Sri Lankan-Singapore Free Trade Agreement, which we signed in 2018, is an icon of our burgeoning economic ties. Whilst the current COVID-19 pandemic has been a very difficult time, I'm glad that our two countries have kept up our collaboration. I'm also pleased to note that Singaporean companies have maintained over the decades 
a strong interest in Sri Lanka, including in areas of food manufacturing, hospitality, healthcare, fintech, and infrastructure development. Sri Lanka remains an attractive destination for Singapore enterprises, large, medium, and small. Sri Lanka and Singapore are natural hubs in the Indian Ocean and in Southeast Asia, respectively. And I look forward to the continued deepening of our economic ties, particularly as we now work towards a post-pandemic normal, a new normal, and to the recovery that awaits us. We will see you on the other side of this break. Stay with us. Big Three. Welcome back. You're watching First at Nine. Parliamentarian of the Samagi Janabalewe, Giharin Fernando, was quizzed for nearly five hours by the Criminal Investigation Department today over his remarks pertaining to the Easter Sunday terror attacks. The MP said after the attacks that his father asked him not to go to church on the Easter Sunday of 2019, since he was told that there would be an attack. Samagi Janabalavegya parliamentarian Harin Fernando was summoned to the Criminal Investigation Department today to record a statement of comments he made in the aftermath of the Easter Sunday terror attacks. The MP arrived in the company of several members of the Samagi Janabalavegya, including leader of the opposition Sajid Premadasa and Secretary General Ranjit Madhva Bandara. Speaking to the media, the opposition leader accused the government of reneging on its electoral promise of delivering justice to the victims of the Easter attacks. ಮೇಲ್ಲ <laughs> After recording a five-hour-long statement, MP Fernando came out of the CID at around 3 p.m. this afternoon. Meanwhile, former President Maitripala Sirisena responded to media questions today on allegations of negligence against him with regard to the Easter Sunday attacks. Pasco Pehare Samando, Janati to Arta Sandana, Butuma, Bagakim Pehari Akilis, Niti Hamu, the Kenyan Kardi Samano, Butuma, the Kunadakumad. Aka, then at a Sresta, the Karne, Bagavana, Naduio. Aganisa, Sresta, the Karne, Vibagavana, Nadukatu, the Piliban, the work, Matheta, Karmu Pedilikarana, Sadajara, Makavat, Niti Bay, was shown to take a Susu Yakne. Continuing with other local stories, the court heard today that MP Rishad Badiuddin arbitrarily gave 260 metric tons of copper produce to one company when he was the Minister of Industry and Commerce during the Government of Good Governance, which incidentally was owned by Easter Attacker in Sub Ahmed. This was revealed when MP Badiuddin's fundamental rights petition was taken up. A fundamental rights petition was filed by parliamentarian Rishad Batiuddin and his brother Riyaj Batiuddin on the 20th of May, claiming their detention by the Criminal Investigation Department as illegal. The petition was considered today before the Supreme Court judge bench comprising of Justices Vijit Manal Goda, Murdu Fernando and Gamani Amarasekara. Representing the Attorney General's Department, Deputy Solicitor General Madhava Tanakoon stated that Mohammed Ibrahim Insaf Ahmad, who detonated a suicide bomb at the Shangri-La Hotel on Easter Sunday in 2019, set up a copper factory in 2017 during the tenure of MP Richard Batiuddin as the Minister of Industry and Commerce. He also said that more than 86% of copper and other metal alloys from the Industrial Development Board had been distributed to his factory and this could not occur without the intervention of the then Minister Batiuddin. Further, the Deputy Solicitor General also added that under the influence of Minister Batiuddin's coordinating secretary, his brother Riyaj Batiuddin had provided an opportunity for Insaf's company to export 260 metric tons of copper in 2019, at a time when the then secretary to the president had ordered the granting of permission to three companies to export the full consignment. 
It was also revealed that then additional secretary to the Minister of Industry and Commerce, Shanmugapille Bala Subramaniam, had permitted this to take place due to the influence of the ex-minister Batyuddin. Further consideration of the petition was then postponed to the 25th of August. Minister of Environment Mahinda Amarvira today announced that the imposition of the total ban on non-biodegradable polythene lunch sheets from the 1st of August. The minister warned that raids will be carried out after this date and the stocking, transport and sale of the items will be illegal, with heavy fines expected to be imposed on any traders found in contravention of the new rules. Non-perishable plastic waste has long been identified as a major contributor to environmental pollution in the country, with plastic lunch sheets accounting for a major share of the waste. In a country of 22 million people, estimates put daily lunch sheet juice at between 12 and 15 million sheets each day. According to experts, each individual lunch sheet takes a staggering 100 years or more to fully break down and decompose. With that, addressing a media briefing today, Environment Minister Mahinda Amaravira announced the imposition of a total ban on polythene lunch sheets from the beginning of next month. in other local stories, Prime Minister Mahinda Rajapaksha says that Sri Lankan employees working overseas are a strength to the country as they contribute massive share of the country's foreign exchange reserves. Addressing the opening of the Regional Consular Office of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Kurunagala yesterday, he added that the government has prioritised human life in all aspects of its COVID-19 efforts. The Regional Consular Office of the Foreign Ministry in Kurunagala was declared open yesterday under the patronage of Foreign Minister Dinesh Vardana and Minister of Highways Johnson Fernando. Further, Prime Minister Mahindra Rajapaksa addressed the event virtually. Mitruni, Mirata de Vishal Vidish Vinime Pramana Ginena, Vidish Kata Sri Lanki Kajanata winning, Ungi Paul winning, Apia Pay you to come to Gala Yutu, Quaid was Angat and Wana, Vadima Vidish Vinime Pramana Lamuni, Ungi Bava, Apia Matar Kali to Nan. Ratagata Barak Vinot Vinwata, O Rata the Shaktiak Vinabai, Apiviswasakaran. Samar Sangwar than Viak with the Karanata Virudai. Add the Nidishpal Navashtal Misak, Ratahu, Janata, and a Kakumang Nui. Tabat Samar Mevilawe, Purantarang Andu Pirania Dila, Vidi Ilim Kerno, Janata Terunga Nona, Pil Loka Wasanga Theatre, Muna Diming, Janata Winning, other Tatu Premier to Kerno, Mitruni, Abimi Hamadim Karani, Koit Palanator, and Nat Karanator, Vega Karanakama, Rajak with the Tapi Givita Bera Ganimata. Welcome back. This is First at Night. Sri Lankan shares closed with little change today as losses in financials and consumer staple stocks offset gains in industrials. The CSE All Share Price Index ended up 0.05% at 8,096.98, while the S&P SL20 Index of More Liquid Stocks gained 2.77 points to close at 3,050.99. With that, here's Dimantha Matthew with today's market report, followed by a currency update. We saw a dip at the start of the session and then a recovery again towards the latter part of the session. So overall the sentiment was mixed today but we saw a bit of a renewed buying interest coming back into the market because of the recovery during the second half of the session. So the ASPI managed to end in the green up by around a mere four points with the index closing at 8096 points.
So overall, we saw turnover levels falling further, less than 2 billion rupees. Only 1.8 billion of turnover was recorded. However, the retail interest was very high. In addition to that, overall, we saw some activity in the plantation segments uh, taking place and also transportation sector as usual uh, topped the turnover list. And that's it from all of us here at First at Nine. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.